All right, everybody, so just to let you know, um, my name is Pam. I am one of the BCBAs here at PBS, and we are going to focus today's training really on understanding what is autism as a whole as a diagnosis, understanding a little bit more in terms of the facts and figures of what that means, and how that really intersects and collides with development. Um, it seems like a good 60-70% of you guys have early learners, so under five. Um, but I also kind of want to give you some information of what uh, evolu uh, evolution, no, no, fun fact, uh, development <laughs> looks like a little bit later on so that you understand and have a good perspective of also kind of what targets and other things are, may be to come. Um, it's important really, to, I feel like, to get that broad perspective because especially in the field of developmental psychology, I feel like everyone dies after five. We're super interested in them from like neonatal till five and then they kind of die. And I'm like, no, no, we have people who are, are still around and we really have to study them. So now we're getting some better research studies with that moving forward. So just to give you guys an idea, right now, this is what we're really gonna hit on and touch. We're gonna really talk about what is autism, what that means in real English, because sometimes we have like the nice little scientific explanation and we don't really get the everyday explanation. What are some of those developmental areas? How are they affected by ASD? How ABA can help support that? And then what else you can do to help in terms of like progressing your child's development? Feel free to ask any questions at any time if you're confused or if you have a comment or will have any kind of clarity. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So, Kind of give, to give you guys the DSM version of what ASD is, and the DSM is basically the psychiatric manual that defines autism as a developmental disorder. It's basically categorized as a developmental disorder with difficulties in social interactions, <laughs> communication, and restrictive and repetitive patterns of behavior. Um, usually the hallmark signs will appear sometimes between two and three years old, so that makes sense why most of you guys are early learners. Um, and often it can be diagnosed as early as 18 months. And even, I've had some cases where it's even earlier. Um, most children, though, in the States, and I would still say worldwide, are being diagnosed after four. And a lot of that has to do with like not really understanding what autism is, the benefits of early intervention. Um, there's some like kind of myth of a wait and see approach. I have no idea what the heck that even is. Um, I learned something really valuable from a professor of mine that all problems, including medical, mental health, and physical health, are like trash. The longer they sit, the worse it stinks. With no other medical kind of condition will you ever have someone go, hi, let's just wait and see if your tumor grows a little bit more to make sure it's cancer. That said, no one ever. So it's really, really important, like if you start to see signs, and with families just in general, to make sure you kind of get things addressed early. Um, now, in 2013, the DSM changed and the new edition came out. So under that new edition, we no longer have, there used to be four different diagnoses when I originally was trained. Now it's just one umbrella condition. So it's called autism spectrum disorder. We don't have Asperger's anymore because it's under that autism spectrum. Uh, a fun little marker called PDD-NOS, which basically is like, I don't really know what your kid has, so I'm just gonna say they have a developmental delay and put it under that. Um, that no longer exists. And then we also have um, social pragmatic language disorder that came under that and uh, childhood disintegrative disorder. So all of that is now just considered one under the umbrella of what autism is. And so just to give you guys perspective, there's three different levels. Um, level one is what's considered mildly impacted. Level two, moderately impacted. And then level three, which is severely impacted. What I tend to find is most people want to categorize immediately upon diagnosis. It's not really fair to do that, absence of therapy and treatment. I, Maria probably has the same experience as me. We've had so many kiddos come in who can't respond to their name, and you meet them three, four, five years later, it's a whole different person. Um, so I really would, and I, I feel like neurologists are doing a much better job lately of holding off on saying, oh, your child's this kind, uh, moderate, mild, or diagnosing a level. They'll, they'll diagnose it probably for a report right away, but they really will tell you like, hey, hold on because that looks really different after the scripts of therapy and a year or two later on. It also may evolve as a child ages. So that's another thing to kind of keep in mind. And the third thing to keep in mind is it depends what aspect of development you're talking about. So I have tons of little guys who have perfect fluid communication but can't go outside and start a conversation. And if you're nine and 10 years old, that's really impacting on your life. So you may be technically level one but in other areas, you're two and three. 
So I, I kind of like to see we're, we're complete humans, and so we don't just fall into one nice little prescribed category. We're really, it just depends the person. And so I kind of want to have you keep that in mind uh, when we're talking about the levels. And so level one is basically requiring some supports in order to kind of get through the day to day. I really love this photo because it gives us a much better understanding. So it requires support. You, you kind of have some difficulty initiating and sustaining social interactions. You have a hard time kind of organizing your thoughts and planning, and it may hamper some parts of independent living. Um, level two, so being moderately impacted, well, you would require some sub <coughs> uh, substantial support. So your social interact uh, interactions tend to be a bit more limited, and you have frequent restrictive and repetitive patterns of behavior. So under that would include what everyone else like knows in the community of stumming, um, maybe some inflexibilities, like I like things the way that I like them and I really want you to turn left because I really like it when you turn left instead of right and I like things in a specific way. And then level three would be having severe deficits in um, communication and in social skills and a great distress in having the change in daily routine or in the independence of the living. Now, I really want to give everybody some like facts so you're able to kind of understand where we're coming from kind of as a clinician standpoint and also just to make you more informed in terms of what the diagnosis of ASD means. So right now, the CDC just approximated a new number that one in every 59 children is born with autism. That is a much higher number. I think when I started, it was one in every 282. So we just moved in less than 10 years, probably two fulls up. Uh, now, it's interesting, it's being diagnosed right now one in every 37 boys and one in every 151 girls. There's really good research coming out, especially now out of, of the UK, that we're actually mislabeling and misdiagnosing girls. So you may see that number in a couple of years kind of um, parallel and kind of get a little bit more even. Um, the symptoms, the way that they're written within the DSM, really kind of cater to a boy, not really to a girl. And so what happens with a lot of young learners I get in the girls, they, get to, uh, they tend to get diagnosed a lot later in life versus early. Because it's like, oh, she has tantrums, she's picky. Oh, she does this. Oh, it's because you know she's she's her snuffity. She's shy. Uh, so we tend to see a lot of also that gender bias kind of coming within um, even the diagnosis rate. So I think that that's going to be a cool, interesting thing to kind of look into in the next couple of years how that's going to evolve. Um, it affects, of course, all social economic groups, all ethnicities around the world. And interestingly enough, that number is going around worldwide. That isn't exclusive to the states. The, the CDC just has studies here. But even working in other places, we see that there's a high increment increase right now of autism around the world. Um, and just so you guys know, and part of what the disparity we're trying to work on is minority groups tend to get diagnosed um, later and less often. So they're also trying to do a really big campaign and trying to get everyone um, to get just better understanding and awareness of what are the red flags and diagnosed or as early as possible. Um, a third of our population right now is nonverbal. It's hard to say. And this is kind of where we have to kind of take things into perspective. Um, lots of our adult and adolescent learners never really received early intervention. Really in Florida in 2009, right, was the, when we had the, the mandate come in where insurances were required to really provide ABA services. So before then, everyone had to basically mortgage their entire life to get early intervention. And unfortunately, a lot of families are still in that predicament depending on where they live. Um, so it's kind of hard to say Right now, that's an accurate number, but is that reflective of students who really receive early intervention? We don't know. I guess it's just kind of a wait and see approach to a little bit later, or really get a better idea of those numbers. Um, and 31% of those kiddos also tend to have an intellectual disability. 25% of our population has a borderline range of uh, like what's considered a below average IQ score, and then 44 have it within the average range of the general population. And just so you um, have a kind of a good number, ADHD is also affects 30 to 61% of children with autism. So there's high comorbidity rates, okay? That means that there's usually two diagnoses as the child ages. ADHD uh, in general tends to get diagnosed much later in development, not early. So- Can you repeat that please? Yep. So okay. ADHD? It tends to be diagnosed in later Later in development, correct, okay. not early. It's, you'll see Peter, uh, I'm telling the truth, let me know. You'll see developmental pediatricians and um, neurologists hesitate to give that label early because the recommendation really on the DSM is to kind of wait till about six or seven. So now we can see kind of some traits and, and understanding of kind of some symptoms 
but we kind of hesitate. It, it can be diagnosed by age three, but not before. Then. Okay, so by three? Behavior therapy anyway. You don't know anything else that Yeah. So uh, the script is still the same, and we're hoping that maybe in the years to come, now we have ABA approved for ADHD, Down syndrome, New York is kind of trailblazing in that, so is California. They just approve it for Down syndrome. So hopefully, maybe we can get some paid ABA therapy too for ADHD in the future. Um, more than half of the children with autism have one or more chronic sleep problems. This is like a current theme I hear all the time, like my kiddo can't go to sleep, they wake up in the middle of the night, and just understand that that's really, really, really common. Um, anxiety disorders tend to affect 11 to 40% of children and teens on the spectrum, so that's also another comorbidity that comes a little bit later on in development. Half of those with ASD tend to wander or bolt, so we kind of see something that we're fascinated by, we kind of start moving along, and we have a lot of incidents of why that's a really important thing that we want to try to kind of reduce in our population. Um, and just to give you guys an idea, just two thirds of those little guys between six and 15 have been bullied. Something that I feel like we're as a community trying to work much better on informing. And there's other things I feel like are starting to happen and take place that help reduce that number significantly for bullying. Um, nearly 28% of eight year olds with ASD have uh, SIV. So it's considered self injurious behavior. Now, that being said, yeah. Sorry about that one. So mm -hmm. it increases at, as they age older that they harm themselves. So why why are they presented as eight years old? Okay, so you want to take kind of because when you have an early learner, uh -huh. there's they usually have not yet received treatment. They tend to do those studies a little later. So by eight, most people have a solid diagnosis, kind of see where they're at. So th that particular study was done in eight-year-olds oh. for that reason. So it's not necessarily that we don't see it in four, two, three, or that, um, it, increases or that it increases. It's just, it's generally you get a more solid, accurate number a little later in development okay. versus early on. Um, that being said, this isn't to scare you guys. Um, I just think it's to be a better, well-informed citizen so that you also kind of know what the diagnosis is, who the population is. A lot of times, many families just know their child specifically with ASD. They don't really know kind of what the community in general is till you know, you guys start getting involved and active, meet other parents really in the community, what's out there. Um, so it's good to just kind of get a perspective because I feel like it helps inform all of us as a community on how to better advocate and really support our population of little guys. Um, so in English, basically, autism is like a sandwich. You need three components for it to exist. There needs to be a deficit in social development, in language development, as well as in behavior. So without that sandwich, maybe you fall into a different category, but that sandwich in total is what makes autism. And at its core, basically, what I like to explain to people is having autism is basically like having a different learning style. Um, it affects the way you view and interact with the world, but it doesn't mean you can't learn. And you wanna make sure that you have the ability to learn and teach the, the learner in the language that they're able to learn in. And that's what I feel like ABA, ABA in general helps bridge that gap from that style of learning, which is a different and peculiar type of learning to the way neurotypical um, uh, human beings learn. And so I always like to just kind of go out and let people know, just because a PlayStation can't read an Xbox game doesn't mean it's broken. And so I kind of want to share with you guys a video that I think is really great. Um, I actually use it a lot for my learners to help them understand and learn about autism. And many times to also tell them of their own diagnosis. We are all different. And that's wonderful. Some differences are easy to see. Height, hairstyle, gender, eye color, and so on. Other differences can't be seen. Our favorite foods, fears, or special skills. Interestingly, the way we see the world is also different. For instance, what do you see in this drawing? Most people see a duck, but some of you might have seen a rabbit. Whichever you saw, you are correct. This is just a trick drawing to show you that all brains work differently. The brain is your body's computer. It works differently for all of us and controls how you learn. That's why we are all good at different things. How you feel, which is why we all feel different emotions. And how you communicate. 
Sometimes the brain is connected in such a way it affects the senses and how we perceive and read situations and interactions. This is known as autism. Many people have autism, so it's likely you already know someone who is autistic. And for this reason, it's useful to know a little bit about autism. The special wiring inside an autistic brain can sometimes make the person good at tasks we may find difficult, such as mathematics, drawing, or music. It can also do the opposite, and activities we find too easy are incredibly difficult to learn, such as making friends. The senses constantly send information to your brain about your surroundings and other people. However, when a person's brain and its senses don't communicate well, the brain can become overwhelmed and confused, affecting how they see the world. Picture yourself walking down the street. This is how an autistic brain may experience the same war. Scary, isn't it? Sadly, in many cases, the person can't say out loud how they feel. So even though there's chaos going on in their heads, they seem okay on the outside, unable to ask for help. We will develop behaviors to help us feel calm in uncomfortable situations. We may look away, hug ourselves, chew our fingernails, fish, bite our lips, and so on. Equally, autistic people develop behaviors that help them cope with these intense moments. These actions may seem unusual, but they're just their way to feel calm. When they happen, it means they are having a hard time. The kind thing to do is not to give them an even harder time by getting cross, ignoring them, or mocking them. Remember, just because a PlayStation can't read an Xbox game, it doesn't mean it's broken. People with autism need friends who are willing to take the time to know them. With good communication and plenty of patience, everyone would be better off. People with autism are not ill or broken. They simply have a unique view of the world. And with a little support from their friends, they might just be able to share that view with us. Autism can make amazing things happen. individual with autism and from the Philippines. So I think he did a really great job of succinctly and accurately kind of describing it, especially for our like early, early learners. Um, so I usually play this when we are trying to inform a classroom that we have a student with autism and how to kind of help support that. And in terms of like the bullying rate, information is power. Um, the kindest thing I just finished seeing last, this month for sure was we informed a second grade classroom that they had a student with autism. And the, there was a classmate of our clients that came up to her and said, hey, um, I heard you have a hard time sometimes. Just so you know, I'll be your friend no matter how hard your time gets. And it kind of just came so organically out of her. And I'm like, wow, just having a little bit of information sometimes then kind of helps children understand and dissect the world. Because they really do know what's going on. Um, it's kind of us that want to shield that from them and not really just give them the tools that they really need to appropriately kind of integrate with the world. So I think that works with um, neurotypical children just as much as it does with children on the spectrum. Um, so something I really kind of, I want to make sure that everyone understands what's part of that sandwich. So we know social development, language development, and behavior. Before, because, I'm a very big believer in group activities. So I'm going to say this with a word of caution. I give developmental milestones to people, but take it with a grain of salt. Development does have some kind of wiggle room, so if your child does not exhibit every single behavior they need two by two, it does not mean that they are completely and utterly behind. We generally give children about three months plus or minus in terms of what's considered normed in early development. Obviously this doesn't apply to kind of kiddos after five. 
there's another kind of set of rules we use for them. Um, but just to give you guys an idea of where a child should be around 18 months, it's really helpful to kind of help guide our programming decisions and really to kind of help you understand and guide this is why this is important at this age. And a lot of, because we're one human being, a lot of goals are interconnected. So most people, the classic one I get now is, at 18 months, your child should be able to drink from an open cup. And that baffles every single person I tell them. So that means from a cup, your child should be able to drink by themselves. We kind of live in a culture where you go down the baby aisle and there's 65 different types of sippy cups. We don't generally see even just the smaller cups. I, only, I think there's like two people who make the smaller, just regular open cups. The reason why it's important to have your child drink from an open cup is, ask any dentist, it's hugely <laughs> effective in terms of their like mouth development. And then even with speech pathologists, once you need a set of skills to learn to drink from an open cup. You have to open your mouth widely, learn to swallow, and that helps so much within language development. So you see one skill there, but there's so much that comes after that that's really, really important. So it might seem silly or like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't want them to make a mess. Like I, I get that really common, and I get that too. Like I don't want to be cleaning my car every five minutes and make it a drinking juice there. But maybe not in the car. But like when you guys are out for dinner, you can just have him make sure or her that they have an open cup to drink from because those are the basics and the foundational skills that help for later on in development. So you'll see things under different categories just so you're aware kind of moving forward. Because what I want to touch upon is now, what are the areas of development? So there are the big four, just so you're aware. Um, every child goes through development, and basically that process involves learning and mastering skills um, that are in inclusive and integrative. So that includes walking, talking, skipping, tying shoes, and all of that. Um, those are called the milestones. Um, and generally they're categorized by age. And there's four main areas and domains of development. There's the physical. So under that you include fine and gross motor. Um, so that's the ability, the child's ability to kind of integrate with their environment. Um, that's where kind of walking, writing would all fall under that area of development. You have the social. Um, how a child relates to the world and sees themselves within that world. Um, the cognitive, so then kind of how you think and see the world, and then the emotional, like how self-aware are you from that, and within that comes also, the social also is married to the language communication portion. So we have subsets within those four, but that's generally the big main four that we see. Now, actually I'm gonna go back. Looking at this, Kind of now, based on what you know a little bit more about ASD, what area of development do you think affects autism? Mostly Are those social. Four in those mostly social. So mostly oh. social right here, right? Oh. Anyone else have any other ideas? Emotional. Definitely oh. emotional. That's emotional. emotional. I'm going to, I would say all of them. I think all aspects of Yes. Yeah. So you guys give a really, you're, you're a really smart audience. <laughs> so really, ASD can depend, depending the learner, every area of development. Mm -hmm. And kind of a hard thing that um, is hard to explain, right now the DSM has categorized the communication under the social. Why? You need one to have the other. So the reason most children with autism have a hard time speaking isn't because their vocal cords don't produce sounds. It's that part of the area of the brain that connects the social with the language to understand when I say ma, 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 this pretty lady appears. When I say pa, 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 this like awesome guy appears that gives me tickles and loves and hugs. Um, and because of that, we tend, to, we tend to recompense in other areas. And so with lacking in that area, it sometimes affects the others. The other thing in terms of why it would affect physical is a lot of our little guys are also born with those comorbid things. So they have a secondary diagnosis that could also affect the physical and also the cognitive. So that was talking a little bit more about that, like those IQ studies and those correlational studies. So I'm hoping we have mostly early learners, and most of my charts are for early learners. If we can make groups, of maybe threes and fours, I'm going to give you guys each one age, and I want you to highlight and kind of talk amongst each other what milestones you think are developed at that age. So I don't care. You guys can like configure whatever groups you'd like. And then I'll come around and I'll pass some of the charts for you.
Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
the way that uh, it presents me. It's like that cloud, right? And so sometimes I'll have like a program to do that, right? And then I'll blend in the paper. So, you know, so there's different ways. Yeah. It depends. I think it's all depends on the kid. Yeah. 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 
that we didn't circle and we were you know just curious if they Absolutely. can I shoot a question okay. mm -hmm. so um, under social and emotional um, gets gets excited when other children do is that something that could be affected yes, in yes. Okay. yes. Um, shows defiant behavior like all kids all. do that so Correct. <laughs> which is exactly why I'm glad that you brought it up because a lot of times people always ask me just like them being too bratty. Sometimes it's just them being too bratty. So it's good for you guys to kind of know that it's, it's way expected in terms of like norm development at two, right. that sometimes we want to kind of push our limit and see where the line is. So that's not exclusive to our population of those. Okay. So that's great that you guys kind of saw that. You know, give yourself a break too. So if you have a two-year-old go, no, all day. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. <laughs> 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 And then one other thing that I was kind of curious about, if you guys remember anything else you wanted to ask, um, let me know. Uh, begins to run, is that something that you do? Yes, Running? depending okay. on if your child also has kind of some uh, physical or motor uh, discapacity. Oh, okay. Because okay. um, we have a lot of guys with like low muscle tone or oh, just right. have a hard time coordinating. So I have kiddos who try to run, it's like, <laughs> and then like, they just oh, like okay. trip over everything. Like falls. Yeah. Um, so that, that's something we tend to see. But interestingly enough, since you have the twos, you pointed out something in cognitive development. So cognitive development is my particular specialty within developmental psych. Um, when we were evaluating kiddos for the state, there's also kind of the other curve of the spectrum that most people don't see. Your child having a hyper-intensive fix for color, shapes, numbers, and being able to name and list all of that is also abnormal in development. Mm -hmm. So I have tons of families who tell me like, oh, my kid can read, and they can decode. So like if we were reading Cinderella, they would like say like, oh, what's a minor time? And then you go, so what'd you say? And they're like, oh, no. And they look at you like this. Um, a child at two shouldn't really be able to recognize letters. They should just like, like outside of McDonald's, it's the only one I really have seen, like double arches, they're like, McDonald's! Um, that's the only one I've seen they really can recognize. <laughs> like, uh, or see for Chick-fil-A, because Chick-fil-A is now starting to get a very interesting reputation there. But really them being able to really know those concrete subjects is also kind of a red flag for us. So a lot of times our parents are like, hey, I don't really think my kiddo has it. They can name letters, numbers, do this. But then they can't tell you if they want water or, mm -hmm. or food. That's, that's one of the first And that's things. the disparity sort of that we see. Like when people say to us, oh, he's fine. He can, you know, my kid can't count to blah, blah. He can do that. Right. That's amazing. There's nothing wrong with yeah. you. But that's a really common that. misconception I wanted to make yeah. sure I touched upon. Yeah. Because that's the other thing. Yeah, I have a patient that before age two, he learned the 50 states of wow. once a while. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And they're very proud of sure that, mm -hmm. you know, because mom was a teacher. Yeah. It's like, okay, it's not yeah. normal. I mean, you can, so confusing. you can add to also that I, I, by connecting with other parents, I see most of our kiddos have an incredible memory. And mm -hmm. that's something they use to do with the reality that sometimes they don't understand abstract thinking, but they can memorize tons of information. Mm -hmm. My son has learned how to speak, but you, have, you use a lot of echolalia. You know, it's not all echolalia, but he learned, okay, mommy said, if I say, I want milk, I'll get, but she, he used even the intonation of my voice. Mm -hmm. And that's how he learned to deal with his environment. You know, so you can maybe, yep. as soon as you specialize in that, you know, and the memory is incredible. Yeah, so I almost feel like there has, so research is sort of coming in this. Like, I have a theory that maybe somebody could pay me a ton of money to research, but I wonder <laughs> if, like, <laughs> um, when, considering that it's, at its core, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder, and if it affects the neurology of your brain. I wonder if, because some areas there's deficits, other areas compensate more. Well, I, I mm -hmm. think so. And I, I kind of always had that suspicion, I just don't think it's like established as science, so I'm going to be very cautious of saying that's not science because we don't know that. But I, I always wonder if that's the case. But we do see kind of those markers of they know all the colors, numbers, and letters, but then the rest is kind of looking a little funky, or just 50 states. I had a kiddo do like an 1,000 piece puzzle. He was the most interesting one I ever probably got. Um, in the middle of our session, he was two. So I was like, what? Yeah, no, so there was like a one that I grabbed as a present, and he did a whole 1,000 piece puzzle in the middle of our session. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the parents like, isn't that great? I'm like, mm. <laughs> All right, so give it up for our two. Group. Get a volunteer, get a volunteer. It can't be an analyst. It has to be a parent. <laughs> it has to be a parent. Yay, we got a good one.
You, you might as well. Why are you, why are you doing I have the funnest job in the world. I really feel like I do. Oh, I do. I want everybody to be an ally. I'm like, I don't have one. Okay, so we had three years. Um, I think it, it could affect all of them, but this is what we thought, you know, in our case, what is going on. Um, we actually have a three year old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice to with you. Yes. So copies um, adults and friends, mm -hmm. takes turns in games, but I think that's everyone sometimes. <laughs> um, shows concern for crying friend. I, I sometimes I, I think they won't really, really know what's going on if somebody's crying. They're just like okay, whatever. I think they keep it moving. Um, understands the idea of mine, his, and hers. That's for social and, and emotional. Language and communication um, says words like I, me, we, and you, along with pl plural words like dogs. Um, talks well enough for strangers for uh, talks well enough for strangers for to understand them. Um, carries on a conversation using two to three sentences, follows instructions with two or three steps. Um, for cognitive development, plays make-believe with dolls, animals, and people. For motor, motor physical development, pedals a tricycle. Um, I believe, you know, like our son, that he hasn't been able to do that at all. Um, screws and unscrews jars and lids. Self-care, puts on coat, dress, a t-shirt, um, brushing teeth independently, dressing and undress himself, um, and taking shoes and socks off. What do you feel like was the most surprising one that you didn't know a three-year-old kind of was a milestone? Uh, well enough for strangers to yep. understand them. And, and, and I think that that's also kind of changed too. It's funny, um, I teach Sunday school, which is a very peculiar, interesting sort of thing to do. Um, and it's funny, I can kind of spot out the kids who always get therapy, and it's something I get all my therapists, you can ask her, she's right here, all, all, all the time. We tend to speak this language, like when we're with them, like, sit down, stand up, yeah. please come. Yeah, and then that. they start to like, Oh my god, and I talk like this. And I'm like, mm -mm. I'm like, yeah. no, like you know, don't really speak like should that. Should we take this normal and just like talk Yeah, you should really kid. try to use as natural language as possible. Um, so I kind of get on them. It's just sometimes like we do this so much and it's almost considered a type of prompt too. Um, so it's really important we use kind of fluid language with them. Like, oh, come on. And even like being around teachers, you kind of see how they talk too. They use some of that prep, but they don't use it as so like. Categorize like that. <laughs> and so just kind of be like, hey, come on, come, come with everybody. Changing up kind of what you say. Um, and another kind of common thing with the plurals, um, we tend to speak a lot in third person to our little guys. So uh, I'll give you an example like, Maria, please come here. Oh, Maria, sad. And, and so trying to kind of also use like plurals and language within like our everyday pronouns would be really helpful. Because then I have a lot of little guys that by the time they end up speaking five, six, and seven, they speak in third person. And that makes them very different from their peers that don't speak in third person. So, for example, my child uses my intonation for everything. Like, I have a certain intonation for certain words, and he says exactly like that. So I should change it? Should it, not because necessarily. I follow the beginning, if you will. Right, so it, um, I think it depends kind of what you're trying to target with the child. I would say, Right now, you kind of where your kiddo's at, depending if you're trying to get him to speak, to kind of imitate more. Tonality is something we tend to work on a little bit later on. Uh, we really want to kind of work on the functionality of their talking, so get them to talk and say stuff. So, and then we'll kind of work on um, perfecting exactly what that kind of sounds like and looks like a little yeah. later on. These are more for like my, my like more adolescent learners and like so my elementary school kids. But it's from years and years from getting therapy too that I'm like, Lord, this is a different language, like. <laughs> They do and they talk like that. But thank you for volunteering. Thank you. Anyone for four? She wanna do together because you did your little thing. Oh no, she oh, can't no, volunteer. Can't. No, 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 I, no, I have forbidden. Yeah, yeah, that was a good three. Yeah. Yeah, go help me. Yes.
Yeah, we could do a co-group. I can do no, no, analysts aren't allowed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Only help you cheat, but not talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's interesting because we did it together. My son is four, her son is two, but we found commonality on how some of the difficulties that we go through. You know, um, on the emotional, social and emotional, I think even for a four-year-old is my son. He has difficulty playing with other children. You know, when we started ABA, we started uh, therapy two years ago, he had difficulty even playing with adults. Now he, has, he feels way more comfortable because I feel we're more predictable than other children. So we're working on the children. And um, one thing that I noticed about that too is that my son gravitates towards adults. He'll go over to adults and take their hands. But if another child comes near him, it's an immediate like this. <laughs> and he'll just do the side eye. And I have video of him doing it to one girl all over the place. He's a great hockey player, though. He does the same. It's hilarious to watch, but it was one of those things where I'm like, why is he side eyeing this little girl? <laughs> so, I mean, the, the development, he knows they're there but he doesn't want to be there, so. Yeah. Do you have any suspicion why you think? Of why he's that way? <laughs> Probably, I have a couple of assumptions. Part of it is he doesn't know them, and he doesn't want to deal with whatever it is they have to bring, because he's got this going on. This is my thing, and I don't know what this is. But with adults, adults are more willing to adapt to kids, and we will give to them, and yeah. mold for them, and yes. I think they I figure think that so. out young. Yes. I think they do that You hit the yes. nail right on the head. So, yeah. Adults tend to be really predictable, follow rules really well, so we don't really have a hard time like learning, what do I do when Pepita steals like my particular like favorite kind of core piece, and then how do I deal with that? So we're a lot more predictable with the social norms. I've seen that across the board, even in my daughter being older, she very much prefers adults that she can deal with versus other kids she will she'll go to kid events but then she'll hang out over here and she'll stay in the corner and she will not and she'll be fine with it she's just like oh it's great it's fun I loved it but it won't even interact at all so just to kind of hit on that that's why so kind of around the world the one thing we fail at even though we have tons of research <coughs> on it in terms of what's really beneficial for our kiddos is what's considered peer mediated learning so basically getting a child to help another child around the world they do that a lot better see so and that's funny that you say that because they would always pick my daughter to help kids in school because she's very good at relating information and telling them this is how you do this and then Nobody asked her to do anything else because, hey, she just gave all this information out. She doesn't have to get up in front of the class. She doesn't have to do anything. But she can peer with other people. So it's funny. I like to pick the most uncooperative learner to kind of help me, too. Because then they kind of really give you a taste of what the real world is like sometimes in terms of really kind of getting that spar match to match. Kind of depends the kiddo who you would match them with. But that's why really getting them... That's why inclusivity is so great, mm -hmm. because it really helps children really learn from one another and get the skills that they need that they cannot get from an adult. Mm -hmm. You cannot teach your child how to turn tape with another child. Yeah. They have to do it with another child. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of really great. I'm glad that you kind of you hit that right on the head. Look, you can have my job now. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, language and development, um, language communication. It was hard, and I can see for the two and three and threes to use the rules of he, she, I, us, you know, and use the plural. You might say, Sammy, Sammy likes. Sammy like running, so I'm saying the Sammy's running, or he refers to himself, Sammy sad, you know, now it's, it's, but I'm so happy that he's actually expressing himself because before he used to, I don't mind is the ukulele and the intonation because he's communicating now, mm -hmm. and that's something that I can work on later on right mm -hmm. with him, but he's telling me what he's needing, so mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that to you specifically, and um, she meant, you mentioned about the story. Um, a couple of things because I, I realize my son is younger, but I also am 16 and a two and a half year old. So that's a cute great perspective. Yeah, there's a there's a little bit of something <laughs> everywhere. But like what my son can do now, even though he can't tell me, he can't for the most part on occasion he'll pop up and all of a sudden go through his whole ABCs. But he can do the song, and you can hear him vocalizing the song. If you listen to him, he's not saying A B C D. He's going through the song, making almost like a melody. And so I know he knows it because he's heard it enough times. Right. And you can hear him as he's running circles around something singing the ABC song. 
Um, and then there's other songs too that if I'm listening to him, I know that melody. There's no words, but there's a melody. So he knows something. He's taking something in and bringing it back out. But what is it? And so we we found that a lot with him. When it comes to telling stories, it is really difficult, or at least I have found when it comes to my daughter. If I ask her directly, even younger, what what is the book you're reading? Because she could read very young. Um, at about three, she was already reading stories to me, so that I didn't think anything of it. I was 20-something years old. I didn't know. So I didn't think there was any big deal about that. But she couldn't, if I asked her a question about it, well, why do you think he was sad? She couldn't tell me because we're not in that part of the story yet. Mm -hmm. So that was the hard part for her. She was like, I don't know. Well, I just answered for her. I didn't know any better. Um, and so even now at 16, she can go through an entire story with me. But if I stop her at the end and say, okay, so what about this? She'll have to back up and start the story over. I'm like, you can't, I want, what about this? And what is your opinion of that? She can't, even at 16, still can't give me an opinion on the story. And there's like a big overall trend going on in reading just in general, just so you guys are aware. Um, people are working a lot on the, the methods of how you used to learn to read have changed a lot, even in the past 20 years. Now you do kind of, what we used to do was like phonological awareness, so understand like this, this sound goes with this letter. And so children would actually take a little longer to learn that process, but out of 100 sounds, you can make a bank of like 300,000 words. Now you, you do a lot of like sight reading. So what I find is that children can what's called decoding. Because reading is actually two things. It's decoding and comprehending. Mm -hmm. So you can decode, right? So they can go, the wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round. And then you go, so what did you, what, what happened with the wheels? Uh -huh. I don't know. <laughs> and so that part is actually the part that you have to work on first. Yes. So, especially when you read a story, because your kid will learn to decode. Mm -hmm. But if you, they don't learn to comprehend, reading is useless to them. Mm -hmm. right. And so that's what, like, it's really great to kind of build that up, even like in like new stories. You read them a story, and then just say like, it was Cinderella, like, who lost the shoe? And then even look at the picture, and then be like, Cinderella! So stop and periodically get them to point. And depending on where your kiddo's level is, they can maybe point to just a duck in the story. That's okay, you know, but you're working on all those skills all at once. I don't know if it happens to one of your kiddos, but my kid is sometimes like the sound of the word. So he wants to read the same page because, you know, Kevin the Hat sounds those, you know, it's very written. And he's like, oh, he gets a please out of that. So, you know, sometimes just the sound. The, on the cognitive level, now once you mention it might be just the behavior problem of a typical four-year-old, my son is very strong-willed. And when he asks about questions about colors, he knows them, but he says it what he wants to. You know, he could say, I'm not interested, I'm going to answer to you. So um, it's hard to actually assess the whole cognitive level, unless it's a specialist will do it, um, because he might understand a couple things, but one that's big for me, in my case, in my son's case, is playing board games, because it's, it, it takes up that abstract thinking, comprehension, mm -hmm. taking turns, so that's difficult. And if something just happens in the book and I have to ask him what, what just happened, he might know that I said, honey, you know, but he doesn't know what, what that he relates to the story itself. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I would say that board games and card games and games in general, if it's not extremely concrete and very easy rules, even, even watching my daughter now, she has a very hard time with it. If it's a game for luck or something that's just kind of abstract just a game you can play she doesn't want to play it she didn't want to play it then she would cry she would just have a complete breakdown if you tried to make her play like mad gab because it's just how am i supposed to pick out these weird things you're saying and make sentences out of it um, just things like that she couldn't do um, and still has a hard time with uh, she was able to name off colors numbers she was able to read pages to me by three that was normal for her um, but at the same time, she has a hard time discussing anything about it. It's, mm -hmm. her, her understanding is, is definitely hindered. It's hard for him also to understand the time. I wanna go play outside, but Sammy, it's dark outside, it's, you can't go play. Yeah, but I wanna go, you know, and uh, when we go to Publix, and uh, no, you can't, it's closed. So the understanding of time, location, and when it's appropriate, the it's different. Um, for modern physical development, um, for four-year-olds, it's interesting because her son is two and she's really strong physically, but my son, overall, using scissors, uh, using a pencil, coloring, uh, standing on one foot, so just, he just learned how to jump with both legs at the same time. 
he just can't learn. You know, he just not learning tricycling. Who we'll said about the tricycle? So it's not to say he won't learn, and I want you to give up on it. He's just having it now. Um, catching a ball. The first time that he, I threw my ball, and he catch that ball, I get emotional because I, I cried because I thought it would never happen. And he happened. So you just you have a four-year-old, not a two-year-old. Well, and the funny part about that, too, is the fact that even with my son, even though a lot of these things he can do, he opts not to because he knows that adults will do it for him if he just doesn't. So if I want to... Well, I'm going to use you in, like, two slides over. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the most frustrating thing because I know he's being a stinker. I know he can do it. <laughs> but he knows he can have somebody else do it. If he just acts goofy enough or whatever it is that he's doing over here or just flat refuses, he'll start boneless is what we call it, where he just slides out of his chair and hits the floor. Because he doesn't want to do what we're doing. So if you see it, it's a fun thing to watch. It's like a little squiggle yeah. worm. Yeah, 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 it's terrible. And, a, and then he, he loves to run. One of his favorite things to do is run. And then you'll just see, just run, 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 boom, up again. Run, 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 boom. And he just falls. Like he'll be sitting in a circle and all of a sudden just hit the floor. And so he does have issues with coordination, right. and I don't know why. I don't know anything about that. All I know is that it just happens. He's fine. There's nothing there. There's no crack in the floor, and he's on it. I don't know how it happens. I don't know what he tripped on, but it happened. Um, so there's definitely some motor issues that I see, but I know he can handle, even at two and a half, a lot of the things, you know, standing on one foot, because I watch him do it. He'll just suddenly turn into, you know, foot and go, just to be standing on one foot for no reason. But if I ask him to do it, he won't even look me in the face. And if your parents to have scooters, right? They're great, but there's so many skills that you have to use to be able to do a scooter, coordination, playing at the turn. Mm -hmm. And it was my dream to see him do a scooter. He just started doing it, and it's fantastic. I, in the beginning, I was losing hope. Oh my God, he's not gonna be able to do it, but he happens. It just takes time, work, and well. On self-care, he's way better, but it does affect uh, dressing himself, independently going to sleep by himself and I think overall even for a seven eight year old it depends on the kid that's going to sleep by himself. Toilet training is a constant battle thing for all kiddos and we just now finally get it for over a year of training. Um, knows where things are in regards to this is what my clothes are, this is what my toys. It just takes a lot of behavioral work to be able to follow through it. Um, uh, you know, he's my son is two and a half. So when I look at all of this, there's no way he's anywhere close to any of that. He's on another planet at this point. But I can say, even when I think back on my daughter, um, most of that stuff, she wasn't she wasn't anywhere close to it. Um, even toileting with her, uh, that was probably one of the roughest ones that we had. It took. Oh yeah, um, she she could go to the bathroom. She was fine with going to the bathroom by herself. Um, but she developed a terrible fear of going number two um, to the point where she would hold it and she would hold it for days. We'd have to take her to the hospital. I mean, it was that bad. And it was something where like we got everybody poops and we had a big family commune sitting around reading everyone poops or whatever the name of the book is. <laughs> My husband is a biochemist, he said he do her diagrams. <laughs> <laughs> I would love those, by the way. <laughs> I mean, it was, and she was just like, well, I know, I know I eat and it has to go out. I know, I know. Then why won't you? Now, interesting um, to say that your husband is biochemistry. biochemistry. Mm -hmm. That was reading a book about, it's called Neurodiversity, and how our world changed so much to having the variations ADHD. And there's a study that made most kids most parents of autistic individuals are very highly intelligent. I don't know if you all know, so it's interesting you say that, that very intelligent people could have a miswire, they call it, and produce kids with, you know, some of the people's understanding and different work. Yeah. Well, and now having a son with, uh, with autism, because I was in the science field too, um, there were certain scientists that if you walked down the hall at the same time they did, they would hit the wall and slide down the wall because they couldn't be near people. They would have to teleconference for our meetings because they couldn't be in the same room with other people. But brilliant. Talking about their Great job. Mind. Hold on to that thought because it's actually going to be on our next slide because that's actually part of what we want to talk about. Thank you. Everybody.
I know. <laughs> I just want to answer that because, like, when they were talking about something, um, my my son's speech therapist is like amazing, Wonderful. and what she's doing with him, I think, helps in a lot of areas, and I think might help other people. So, what we do is, um, like, when he's reading a book. <laughs> We don't read it the same way. Like maybe I'll read it backwards or I'll skip pages. So one that helps on his rigidity because he wants it and he wants to memorize it. He wants to read it and all that stuff. And we used to have to take away books from him because he was just so obsessed with them. But now it's like, okay, we're gonna read this. We're gonna read page one, page five, page six, and then you know. So we do that, which helps with his rigidity. That's then really sometimes we don't read the book. Sometimes we just say, what's going on on the page? Okay, they're outside, they're doing that, where are they? And now she's um, integrating it with, what are they doing, what did you do? Oh, he's eating a sandwich, what did you eat today? And it's really hard for that abstract thinking of, what did I do today? But he's kind of, oh, I had crackers and cheese. Oh, she's wow. eating a sandwich. So it's like so much you can do with a book that helps in so many ways. So if people want to try that, it doesn't That's have to just be idea. I'm reading a book. Yeah. It's what are they doing? What did you do? Oh, they're going out because you said outside. They're outside because it's daytime. The sun is out. Oh, this yeah. now it's nighttime. They don't go outside. So, you know? They try to do for him to, it's called Sammy Visual Book. Mm -hmm. Nice try to do it. We, Put pictures of the okay, kids are playing outside with the sun is out. So we're right. relating yeah. a visual aspect to understand there's no time to play right now. Yeah. And putting a mood, the kids go to sleep at night. So this yeah. is relate one information to the kids. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's a lot of things you guys can do. Yes. Um, we all can. I think it's the most important thing, yeah, maybe she's thinking with the therapies. They have a lot of um, knowledge, they recognize a lot of things. But the thing is the connection between the skills yeah, together. Yeah. So when you try that, the uh, child make the connection between the, the, the things that he recognized. This is the progress, the big progress. Mm -hmm. Because you see, they can recognize different states, different numbers, letters. The thing is they make the connection between those concepts. Um, when she say, for example, um, outside it's raining, uh, what happened when it's raining? Right. She's trying to motivate him the connection between the reality and the, and the issue that is happening now. So this is the, the, the thing that we can try to get in each time that we go with the, those child that they make the connection between the and they help kind of bridge the, the splinter skills. So um, when we have kiddos who kind of have some, some here, they can do this, but not that. That's called splinter skills, just so if you guys ever want to look that up. Mm -hmm. So that, from what you're talking about is kind of unifying so that development looks a little bit more uniform within those splinter skills. And then also honoring their beautiful like interests sometimes too and kind of letting them take the flow of where their development will go to. Uh, number five, are we good? You got lucky. You got like five minutes. <laughs> Number five. Well, we so have six, we have six and eight too. You have six and eight. Oh, I'm actually gonna do six, eight, uh, six through eleven. Because okay. oh, I'm gonna okay. hit on that for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so we got number five. I'll be quick. I promise. Oh, no worries. No <laughs> worries. Hurry up. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> for me, my son actually can do pretty much everything on here. Um, so I try to really think about everybody else's experiences and think about other different children on the spectrum. For social and emotional, for five-year-olds, I feel like um, a kid on the spectrum definitely would have a lot of challenges doing these uh, specific things like wanting to please friends, wanting to be like other kiddos, um, agreeing to rules, for example, like playing board games and very structured activities like that. Um, Singing and dancing and being aware of gender, I think, is a possibility for a five-year-old. I think they can definitely categorize, okay, I'm a boy, this is a girl. Um, and also, you know, singing and dancing, they kind of know, you know, when it's okay to do those things. Um, can tell what's real and make-believe. I still feel like a neurotypical child at five years old would still have issues distinguishing between those two. Um, 
shows more independence, for example, may visit a next door neighbor by himself or supervision, but st is still needed. I feel like no five year old should be wandering by themselves, <laughs> but I mean, it's possible for a uh, uh, Tell you a fun story about that. Yes. <laughs> <You're on. laughs> um, is sometimes demanding, um, is sometimes demanding and sometimes very cooperative. I feel like that one is still a skill because it's, it's both both ends like you know they could be very cooperative when it comes to a play activity but when you're trying to get them to go to bed or trying to get them to take a bath it could be the total opposite um language and communication uh speaking very clearly telling a simple story using full sentences um using a future tense as in like grandma will be here or we're going to be going to disney i feel like an, um, an atypical child would not be able to extinguish that yet at five years old um, say their full name and address. Uh, it's possible for uh, the children that, that do uh, speak and, and, and uh, use those verbal, mm -hmm. but for my son, unfortunately, he's nonverbal, so that's just, we're not there yet. Um, cognitive development uh, counts 10 or more things. I definitely think that um, a five year old could definitely do that. Um, can draw a person with at least six body parts. Oh, I think that's a little difficult. That's a little bit. No, but I mean, maybe the house of wish, you know, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, maybe a cartoon character, but I'm like, a person? That's a little specific. Um, can print some letters or numbers? I definitely think that they'll be able to do that. I think, like, the writing is, is there. It may not be exactly in the lines. Um, copies triangles and other geometric shapes. I definitely feel that a five year old could definitely do that, being that, uh, like, shape sorting skill and stuff like that is usually. Not mastered, but they're pretty good with that at that time. Um, knows about things used every day like money and food. I still feel like a, a five-year-old would not be there yet because money is a very abstract concept mm -hmm. and it's like planning and um, motor and physical development. My son has low muscle tone, so he has difficulty doing a lot of uh, typical things that neurotypical and atypical children can do. Um, stands on one foot for 10 seconds or longer. I definitely believe five-year-olds on the spectrum can do it. Um, hops may be able to skip, I definitely think so. Um, can do a somersault, not yet. <laughs> Uses a fork and spoon and sometimes a table knife. That one could be 50-50. There are some kids that can self-feed, you know, predominantly with a spoon, but I mean, a knife I think is still jumping to conclusions <laughs> well, for five. Um, can use the toilet on his or her own and swings and climbs. Oh, the same thing. Potty training, I know, is an issue for a lot of kids on the spectrum. Um, my son can definitely not do the toilet on his own yet, um, but he does swing and climb, and he's almost completely independently swinging, and I definitely think that that's a functional thing that most five-year-olds on the spectrum can do. Um, Self-care. Opening a lunchbox, Ziploc bags, and food packaging, I definitely think most five-year-olds can do. It's like a one-step process. It's not like making a sandwich. Um, sitting at a desk, following teacher's instructions, and independently doing simple in-class assignments. I definitely feel like 80% still can't do that at five years old. I think that's a skill that is probably And I would say that, that, that goes to neurotypicals too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so if they were like at an eight range, that skill could probably be mastered. Um, Settling independently for sleep? I don't think so, even um, for some neurotypical five-year-olds. Uh, packing a bag for school or other outings with assistance? I definitely think it's possible uh, for a five-year-old. Uh, wiping independently? No. And tying shoes? It's kind of in the air. I think that, you know, unless there's like a you know, gross motor dis you know, delay, I think a, a five-year-old should be able to kind of tie the shoes, but I don't, I don't know, on the spectrum. Perfect. Guys, I'm really proud of you. You learned to read the CDC charts pretty well. <laughs> but the interesting part is probably the most common one I think that most people don't really know when a child's supposed to do her self care skills. So I can't tell you how many children cannot wipe their behind at five years old. And not necessarily because there's a physical or motor impediment, but Kind of going back on the topic you were saying is it's been done for them forever now. Um, and trust me you love your child <laughs> but i will never love your child the way you love your child <laughs> <laughs> so we want to teach that probably first <laughs>
Um, but kind of going on that, just to give you guys a, a perspective, then we start moving into what's called middle childhood. So middle childhood is really kind of the range between 6 and 11. Um, by that point, we're looking for a lot of those skills to somewhat be mastered a little bit better. So being able to really have the dexterity to kind of do everyday things, that's when you kind of sort of see the stage of the mini adult developing. Obviously, they can't do everything that they're supposed to do, but somebody was talking about like having children go off without supervision. Um, as a society, we've moved away from that, and we've actually lost a lot from that because there's a lot that children learn to do absent of parent intervention. What's your opinion about when they reach some of the developmental pediatricians say or others that they, once the child becomes, uh, turns seven, eight, that they're inflexible and that's how they're gonna be as an adult? So that goes against like every grain of thought I ever have as an analyst. I think everyone's able to change, Yeah. period. So, I mean, are you gonna make- and environment, right? But you know, it makes you think it's run away. And if you can change the environment, you can change anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I kind of train my parents and they don't really know much. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. Um, but part of it is too, I think what they're, they're wanting to get at is in terms of like, are you gonna see, as a child ages, the gains that they make will not usually be as large as within early development. I guess that's what they mean. But that, or does that mean that that person isn't worth having help and support and intervention and really trying to put effort forth, especially considering, remember, most kiddos are still diagnosed after four. Does that mean they're not worth trying? Absolutely not. So that's kind of the, the holistic I wanted to give you in terms of six to eight. You're really starting to understand like the future, the past, how that affects you, um, how, how you experience peer pressure and others. That really starts to develop a lot more in middle childhood. Um, being able to kind of understand there's rules about girls and boys. The social complexities really, really grow in middle childhood. Um, and understanding the norms and rules, like you can't touch Miss Pam's boobs when we greet. That's one, uh, just because they're, you know, no. So understanding that, understanding personal space is a big one with a lot of our learners. So I have friends that are like, hi, Miss Pam. I'm like, hello, <laughs> how are you? Um, understanding like left and right, you're really working on some of those independent skills. And so just to give you guys kind of a resume, um, so we all worked on a group activity, and I want you guys to know if you're right or wrong. And this is actually a really great uh, printout uh, that the state of Oregon or Utah, I'm not sure, uh, worked with the CDC on. Um, and it's really great just so you guys have a good idea. That would be a great one for you to have about the, uh, your son. And so just to review, you're all right and wrong. <laughs> so all of the skills you highlighted could be possibly right and could be wrong. Why? Because every child is different. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to treat it on a case-by-case -case basis. And understanding that your child development is unique to themselves. And so it's good to have that reference and call of like what others look like so you can kind of see, but understanding that every kiddo is different. And it's okay. Their gains are gonna be huge gains. And I love the fact that you spoke about like, hey, don't, don't be discouraged. They can't do that right now, but maybe later on. And I think that that really helps for us to know as a community, like we're gonna celebrate and achieve each child's success because it may look different depending on the learner we're working on. Um, remember, it's a spectrum. So where you fall on the spectrum will really much kind of affect your ability to learn and develop those milestones. And there's not one type of autism. I've, probably seen like 300 kiddos from the time I started to now. There have never been two alike. Really? Not ever. No. You have some that have kind of like shared traits, but I even remember each child I have like based on a skill or thing that they do. Like I had a SpongeBob kid I started with, and then like I remember like something very peculiar about them that makes them them. And you're, you're never gonna see a carbon copy. Even if you have identical twins, or dealt with twins, they're completely different. So each child is within themselves, their own little universe. But it's good to have the understanding of what the milestones are because that's how we know what to target. And just so you know, kind of in our line of thinking in terms of behavioral therapy, the first and immediate, immediate thing that gets treated is safety. So if there is any target that impedes your child's safety, that is the first and only concern as an analyst I have. So if your child wanders, that is the first thing I need to work on. I understand you want them to learn letters, but if they wander off, that's a bigger problem for me. Because that will involve, you know, lots of other consequences that maybe sometimes we don't foresee. So that's why we really work on safety skills first. 
And on top of that, with our learners who are, end up being vocal, I really kind of start teaching them, if they get lost, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. And teaching them their name, their age, who's their mom, what's their phone number, so that they can, because it happens. I got lost in the mall. I mean, I don't know how many people like lose people in the mall. It happens all the time. So, I, you know, staying calm when that happens, being able to speak to a stranger. There's lots of skills that come into that. But understanding one thing is dangerous. If your child likes to climb things, a lot of things are, are not bolted and they go, so that's a really big skill we ought to work on. So understanding the focus of every analyst is always going to be on safety. So that comes before everything because without that, everything else impairs. You don't get the right to put your hands on me, ever. That's a safety issue. So that gets worked on first. So those are the skills we really target absolutely first out of all developmental skills. I see. And then secondly after that, um, we always start working on quality of life skills. Because I want everyone to read it and, and I want everyone to have the most full and productive happy life possible. But depending on kind of what your, where your child falls on the spectrum, I'll tell you this, you will never have to pay someone to read you a letter. But if you can't brush your teeth on your own, I'm going to as an adult, have to pay someone to do that for you. If you can't wipe independently, if you're not able to kind of follow a day-to-day -day routine, that's why there should be a good emphasis on a lot of self-care skills. Mm -hmm. Because we don't see it as a big deal now, but again, nobody loves your children like you do. And try wiping a 15-year-old, 16-year-old, looks very different, very different. And that's kind of the big thing, like we, we wanna make sure we see an eye to the future, not just that your kiddo's little right now. Because things, and I've even, I've even had families, like the kiddo hits and they start laughing and I'm like, oh, you think that's funny? You haven't been slapped by a 12 year old yet. It's not funny. So those are the things we really want to work on. And what's going to improve this child's quality of life in the long haul? Right. Not for today, but for tomorrow. That's why like toilet training is a really great skill we all work on. Um, I've never met an analyst that didn't work on one. Um, feeding. Sorry? Feeding. feeding. Self-feeding. Um, Self-dressing. Uh, as they get older, learning to complete chores in the house, being a cooperative member of your home. Yeah. Like, you need to learn to make your own bed. Put away your own toys. Mommy's not your slave. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's the phrase my mom says. I stole, I, I stole that from her. Um, so, understanding that you're part of a community in a home, you need to contribute. And that's something really beautiful I, I learned from my recent trip. Like, everyone can do something. So, no matter where your child falls, everybody can do something. So even if they have physical limitations, we can do something, we can improve the quality of life for that child in, in different types of ways. So that's why, especially those self-care skills, they're gonna be really big markers. But part of quality of life too is learning to communicate. So that kind of comes hand in hand. So then we work on what those are first. And then the third kind of set of goals that we start working on is what is considered an impairment of autism. So the symptoms themselves, we don't necessarily treat. It's the impairment of that. So we just heard that at a talk. And so they pointed out a couple nice friends that sometimes they're a little quirky. So I'm gonna give my own example. My college roommate, um, he was quite interesting. Super high IQ. Um, he is now a biophysicist. Uh, he finished his PhD when he was 25. Um, and we were a very small dorm. And my parents, like the concept of like letting me go away was so like weird to them. Um, and so when they came, they dropped us off. He came in like all black and like a trench coat. And then he used to like wearing like superhero stuff. And I was like, oh, okay, you're interesting, all right. Um, and he wore a different one all the time. But as I got to know him, he told me he never brushed his teeth because they like, he didn't like the way that the brush felt on him and it irritated him. And I'm like, but that's why you've had like 15 root canals, baby. So that's a problem. Um, he was really interested in dating, but like he would come off so awkward to girls that like people would repel him. So I always say like he was like my first, like he didn't know it, he was my first ABA client. <laughs> and so I like helped him get a girlfriend, like I fixed his team. wardrobe, like learning about self hygiene. But like even if you have all the intelligence in the world, but you can't like relate to others, that's what gives your world color. Your ability to relate to others is what gives your world color. Without them, what else is the rest? And so we deal with more the impairments of what it causes. So if there's a delay in communication, how to help support that in terms of the social development, that really becomes critical as they hit middle childhood. We right. want to start working on that as they're little in order to kind of reduce the delay that there is in social development and then the repetitive and restrictive patterns of behavior. So sometimes like, I love that lawyer gave the example when we were at the training. His son liked to line up things in a particular way. Was that abusive? Did it kill anybody? No. But it impeded his learning. 
So it needed to be interrupted so that virginity can learn to like play and do other things every day. Are there some professionals that are saying that completely eliminating those be those behaviors could be actually a problem for the child because that's how the child calms themselves? Correct. So that's it's kind of like a balance. So it's not necessarily saying, oh, we're going to eliminate everything. And I'm glad that you brought that up because what we want to do is really look for things that would affect their quality of life. So it's not necessarily like, so my family's all the time. You wouldn't need me if all your kid did was this. You really wouldn't. But the fact that he does this in front of six-year-olds that can possibly bully him is a problem. So I think it's also looking at it in the context of when it occurs and how it occurs. Or replacing the behavior. Correct. Right. So, the, the, the goal is to make them make them successful members of society, right? right. So mm -hmm. that they don't sit out, that they can you know, uh, be independent. So that social gap, I understand maybe with a two, three-year-old, there's a lot of emphasis initially, but if we don't address the social skills, the gap will only get wider and wider with their peers. Right. And then when they reach, you know, middle school, then there are other problems that develop from that. So um, I think that the course of and our objectives and goals in ABA change accordingly to the need of the child. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And also depending on the need of the age, because that makes a big okay. difference. So like um, with some learners, like I want to work my way out of a job. I like that. And so the gold standard, of that's why it's the gold standard right now for treatment of autism and, and definitely for behavioral interventions. But the way I work myself out of a job is when a non-behaviorally trained person can teach your child. Right. That's when I'm done. And so when that can happen, then we can really transition. And I, again, we kind of start working in later life towards what's considered like self-regulation. So I have lots of kiddos, they call it the wiggles, right? That they just like, this, and they like just have to kind of get it out. And so what I teach them to learn to do is regulate that in private. Right. So not that like, it's okay, you want to wiggle, I mean, it's not killing nobody. But just so they learn, I have to do that in private because right. when I'm with other people, they think that's a little funky. Yeah. And so just know um, ABA helps in terms of kind of ameliorating, so making better the impairments of autism. But I also kind of feel there's been a movement and I want to make sure I recognize parents in terms of that and, and even individuals with it, it's not like I want to cure them or make them different or conform them. They're beautiful, awesome individuals I want to celebrate and like help be their best selves and be their best selves wherever they go and whatever they choose to do in life. But I don't think it's fair also to kind of not recognize that there are things that are within ASD that do cause impairments in their life. And so kind of learning the balance of that. And so during the assessment, you can help, you know, really contribute with your analyst in terms of how to prioritize those goals. So remember, we're going safety, quality of life, then ameliorating the impairments of autism, and then in that order. And then we use lots of strategies to kind of break down those skills. So you see a, a skill as big as, for example, toilet training. So toilet training, you need skills before you toilet train. What are the skills? you got to pull your pants up and down. Now there's learners who have different deficiencies that we work with their OTs and these PTs like on how to help do that. But generally, if you can't pull your pants up and down, how are you going to get to the toilet and pull your own pants up and down when you're peeping the pot? Oh, my heart of business. So a lot of the skills require other skills before they get there. And so that's what uh, your BCBA can help you do, kind of break down those skills to help them build on each other. So before you can drink from an open cup, you have to be able to hold the cup. That's a prereq skill we don't think about. So understanding those small little individual goals to end, end up getting to where you really want to be. And so some examples of what kind of things that we work on is learning to understand stop. We have to do that even when they're two and three because it's a safety issue. So learning to accept no. Half of adults can't do this, but <laughs> this is a very necessary skill in life. You gotta learn no. Um, having, having them complete their daily routine on their own. Um, learning to communicate, share with others, and tolerate changes in life. Sometimes it rains, sometimes it's nighttime, sometimes I don't know, I forget things. You gotta be able to deal with what comes at you in life. And the more you practice that, the more, the better you become at it. And first things first. Remember, we wanna work on the prereq skills, so those safety skills first, and our goal is to always work our way out of a job. We really don't want to be with your kid forever. As much as we love them, I want them to be part of then like my friend old school group. Like I love talking with a lot of my old clients and kind of seeing who they've become. And I bumped into one I was telling Dulce at Trader Joe's the other day. Um, it was great to see kind of the people they've become. So definitely not the goal is not to be as, with us forever, just as long as they need us in order to then be help. You know, they're they're able to be taught by someone who's not behaviorally trained. Okay. 
And then, how do you help? So you help ask questions. Everybody did here did a really great job of sharing, like joining a parent and community, understanding like you're not the only one struggling with stuff. Like they're complicated little boogers. They are, like they really are. And they're like really good psychologists sometimes where they learn to cry with one and not the other and when it rains and when it doesn't and you're like, oh, that doesn't make sense. So ask questions. Don't be like nervous to ask. Like sometimes we don't know too. You have to be able to know like, I don't really know the answer to that today, but let me look into it. Um, but always feeling free to ask questions and knowing where to go for that. Um, being involved in your child's session. So at the end of the day, like I can teach a child to brush their teeth, but I'm not there when they wake up and they when they go to bed. So I need mommy and poppy to be there. I need that. Or grandma, grandpa, nanny, whoever. Like I don't care. I'll take the whole truck. Um, and I generally do. But then if everyone supports and is on the same page, that child always will make a bigger leap than a child who doesn't have good parent involvement. Period. I love our analyst because she offers you guys having issues. Let's have a meeting, and then we sit up with Melanie and now RBT and my my husband, and even my nanny participates because I work. And okay, there was everybody's concerns, and then Melanie just listens to, to us. Melanie's our analyst, you know, answers, it listens to everybody, and then she develops a plan and she observes and she helps. I think it's very important to have that meeting even at home or in school, but participate in everybody. And don't be afraid to ask questions. There's nothing that crazy I haven't heard. Trust me. Yeah. I have heard some crazy questions. <laughs> like, but it's no judgment. You know what I mean? Because I know that there's things that, like, I've had parents who didn't even know how to change a diaper before they had children. That's okay. Let me teach you how to do it. Like, I'm really here, and I want to be here without judgment. I feel like I'm trying as best as I can to also help inculcate that in the new generation that's to come of analysts, too. Like, learn that everybody has questions. It's okay. Um, it's, there's no harm in not knowing. The harm 